Welcome to the audit committee today. Thank you for all the members that have, have attended. Uh, the first item of business to conduct today is to appoint the chair of the committee. Um, if members have any nominations, you can put forward. Any, any other nominations before I ask for it seconded? No, is everyone happy and content to second that? Thank you, vote. That's a lot to appoint to the duly appointed chair for, for next year. Uh, the, we, we also need to agree that the vice chair, which is under the constitution, one of the two independent members. Reese, I was, yeah, I was going to say, I was going to ask you if you were happy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right, welcome to this uh, audit committee meeting, uh, and thank you for putting me in the chair again. Um, we are a smaller committee today, due to changes that the uh, committee recommended and have been accepted by the MCA for a trial period of one year. Uh, this is a transitional period for us in many ways, I hope. Uh, and we'll go on from strength to strength in our present and developing format. So are there any urgent items or announcements? Nope, I don't see any. Items to be considered in the absence of public and press? None. Declarations of interest by any members, pecuniary or otherwise? None. Reports from and questions by members. Nope. Minutes of the previous meeting held on 24th of March 2022. Can we agree them as a correct record to start with? Yeah, thank you. I've got a question on the minutes, actually. Yes, that's my next. Okay. It was a, a factual one, that's all. Um, it was on... Uh, um, the paragraph 31 about the internal audit report, um, I didn't think we had taken 41 days from the previous year's plan. Uh, I thought we'd taken 24. The 41 days, I think, refers to the amount of time that was going to be spent on the community transport review rather than the amount of days that have been taken out of the audit plan. Sorry, I think, well, we just need to check that one yeah. and, and follow up with internal audit colleagues. If you compare it with the report, that the, the numbers have just got skewed there. Thank you, Chair. Uh, we had a meeting on the 21st of May. Um, there were just the two independents in attendance, so strictly speaking, I should have rearranged it, but it, it seemed a waste of everyone's time to do that, so we, we went ahead. Um, as usual, we had a business update uh, to bring us up to speed with current developments. I think the key points were the confirmation of government funding to October, um, with a significant amount going to TRAN. Uh, but the funding requirements came with, uh, I wouldn't say strings, but with conditions that we undertook a network review. Um, and that's been going on, and approval of the review um, will go to the CA in July. 
Um, but onwards, I think the key takeaway we had from that, that there are going to be some hard decisions to make on what type of network we wanted to provide and what type of network we could afford. Um, we looked again at the delay on capital schemes, which still remains an issue, um, and we were um, informed about conversations continue with DFT on how this can be progressed and, and funding maintained. This isn't just um, a South Yorkshire issue, it's an issue across the country, um, which has been compounded by the, the pandemic and uh, inflationary changes. So there is a, um, a nationwide problem there. Um, we heard about the progress on risk management development, um, uh, internal audit and external audit. Um, these are all on the current agenda, so I wasn't pro uh, planning to preempt discussions, but um, uh, until those um, uh, representatives uh, reported to the committee. Um, on the audit plan for next year, the panel had some concerns about the deliverables for the authority from the net zero audit. Um, and understood from um, the internal auditor that further discussions would be had when the actual scope was drawn up for that. Um, we then discussed my year-end report, report, which is on the agenda anyway, so I won't, I won't go through that uh, until we get to that item on the, gen on the agenda. And finally, we discussed um, the future of the panel um, now that integration was complete. And we concluded that although we saw that there were some areas in which uh, the panel could support the committee, um, specific risk areas and some oper operational issues, um, they, that, uh, which were suggested by, by Liz, we thought that overall it was for this committee to decide whether it needed a panel um, to support it and what it wanted that panel to do. Um, so perhaps that was something that ought to go on the, the next agenda and um, when it was clear um, what skill set the, the new independents would have when they're recruited. That's it, thank you. Happy to take any questions. Comments or questions? Good. Um, so, uh, thank you for your report, Angela. On the, uh, on the audit plan, it makes reference uh, to the community transfer advisory project, is that a different project to the audit plan phase? Uh, yeah, uh, um, that's, the, that's the audit plan days. Um, sorry, that's issue. the audit plan days. And I think when we discussed it, uh, the, the issue was that although we'd taken uh, 24 days out of the plan, that were going to be allocated to this audit, because uh, I think they've been allocated to integration, and it was felt that this that wasn't the year to do it. Um, because a different team was going to be doing it um, from the internal audit team, the actual advisory audit was going to have 41 days allocated to it um, this year when it was started. And I think that's where the confusion over numbers came from, um, because we brought, we brought 28 days forward from last year and we took 24 days off the, the audit plan last year. Um, so it, it, there was just some confusion about it. So there's going to be, as it were, an in-house, the, the work is transferred to an in-house... No, 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 it, it's a, a specialist in. team with, with Grant with Thornton. Yeah. Um, but it's an advisory Which piece, so it won't be counted in the audit opinion. Ah. Right. Yeah, and I think we knew from a previous meeting it was going to a specialist team. Yes, thank you, Chair. That clarifies it for me. further let's have that report thank you very much um, risk management Liz thank you chair um, the paper that you have in front of you today covers two areas the first of which is the development activity the second being the key risks to the organization in terms of the development activity we're progressing well to implement the framework the new risk management framework which was agreed earlier this year um, we are going through the organization working with business plan owners which are predominantly team leaders to deliver workshops across the business those workshops cover a short presentation on the core principles of risk management um, they also cover 
the risk management framework and a subsequent discussion about what that means for uh, directorates, managers and teams. Uh, the sessions, the workshops then move into what is in effect a controls risk self-assessment exercise to identify, assess and evaluate the risks that the team feels is appropriate for their area of business. Um, through those workshops, we're also considering any residual risks that arose from the integration program work streams, the uh, PTEs for risk system, and also anything that seems uh, to present itself now from the old MCA risk registers. So that hopes to ensure that nothing drops through a gap between the old systems and the new. Um, so, since, so that's progressing well. Just an update on the table in the paper, in the pie chart that you, you have in the paper. Things have moved on since that was written. We now have uh, 18 of the workshops delivered out of a total of 21. We have 12 risk registers at what I would call a final stage because, of course, the risk register is only at a point in time. Uh, we have six risk registers at a draft stage and three workshops still to run where I'm uh, either carried out the prep already and issued it or I'm uh, working on the prep now. Once all those risk registers are drafted, um, the intention is to be able to enhance the reporting into this committee to include the, what is in effect the high level risks of the organisation and also to be, de to be able to de-escalate the risks from the report which are green, which are the low level risks which the committee will not want to be too concerned about, hopefully. We're also in the process of testing the risk management system. Uh, so as part of that testing, we have input the corporate risks. That system has been used to drive and to generate some of the reports that you have, or the graphs, sorry, that you have in the report today. Um, so as part of the discussion, I'd be really interested to hear what the committee feel about that paper and whether that, that seems fit for purpose now. That's as much as I want to say about the development activity. What it, I've said quite a bit there in terms of the detail in order to give the committee some assurance that we're progressing and we're implementing the new framework and that is work in progress. In terms of the high level risk, Angela has already mentioned the recovery funding aspect uh, which has been confirmed to the 4th of October. That's insufficient to meet the needs of the existing network and further work is being undertaken. In terms of the basic risk, um, sadly the MCA wasn't awarded government funding for that, uh, but despite this, um, MCA colleagues continue to progress the enhanced partnership arrangements to the original time scales. Regarding the work associated with the tram concession, a paper is to pr be presented to the MCA in July, setting out options and an assessment of the operating models. As far as uh, closing risks and moving risks on from that corporate risk register goes, um, we have now closed the integration program related risk as uh, that's now moved into business as usual operation. And as I said earlier, resi any residual risks arising from the work streams are being considered through the workshops with teams and business plan leads to ensure nothing drops through any gaps. Um, and come the end of this month, early next, we propose to close the mayoral election risk. And at that point, the risk will become spent. Uh, that's as much as I'd like to say, which was quite a lot.
Hello to the screen here, everything. Are there any comments or questions on the report? Brief. I think um, the first point I'd like to make, Liz, is that in the year that you've been involved with this now, we've seen a, a vast improvement, I think, in the way that, that risk is now being addressed. And, I, and I, I'm actually quite, quite impressed with the way that this, this has come forward. Um, so you are to be congratulated on that. And I, and I know you're moving on, so you, know, you, need, you need to take a, a great vote of thanks. Um, and I know I've been personally banging on about certain aspects which, which, which you now included, and I do like the graphs. And there are, there are some questions that arise from that. So, I mean, it's clear, if we look at the graphs, which are on page, I think, 32, um, we can see that the red risk is a city in the operational transport area, which is no surprise to us. Um, and they also are under the Directorate of Infrastructure place, as you call it. Um, do we now have a head for that organisation? Because that, that was a post, I think, that hadn't been filled um, two or three months ago. Is that, is that post now filled? And, I, and I'm just not aware of it? I, um, if we, we have an interim in post, that's um, Martin Swales, who's the um, exec director. We, we are out to recruit for that, but what we, we do have as well are um, our directorate um, leads, so uh, public transport leads, strategic transport leads, and, and so on. So, yes, those I'm aware of. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and that's how you're addressing it at the moment, with the individual cases, really heavily focusing on those two individuals. Yeah, so the, the, there is a significant amount of recruitment um, to build on the target operating model uh, that we, we undertook as part of the integration exercise. So we're, we're moving to fill those posts. Yeah. Um, did you want to? Yeah, I was appointed on Monday, yeah. that going to impact us? Does that have an impact in terms of the running of the tram? Um, salary escalation, presumably with inflation. Where do these sit in, in, in the risk register? Sorry, in, ter in terms of uh, the resourcing across the piece, then <coughs> yes, we do, have, we do have some issues. There is a risk within here around the workforce, um, and as part of my work with teams across the business, that is a constant that is coming up within the teams. And as yet, um, as I said earlier in the presentation about the development, I'm working with the teams to identify what they perceive to be their risks. And once I've got all of that in place, I will then look to, or the organisation will look to, understand what the detailed risk registers are telling us in terms of the corporate risk so we do still have some alignment to do Reese in order to reflect the team-based risks which is where some of your points are coming up okay so it's part of that work in progress I think Reese. I don't know if Steve or Gareth would like to say anything about the resourcing I think from resourcing it's picked as, as they said it's picked up um, in most of departmental plans that I've seen anyway, certainly, because it is, a, is, it is an issue and we are on a significant recruitment drive to deliver the operating model that we have in, uh, we're implementing. So I think it, it is an escalating risk. Um, I think on the other point about the rail strike, I, I, that's not a direct risk at the moment. It's not spilled over into the tram yeah. as yet. But, and that, that comes with a, you know, because obviously we're entering significantly high, in, high inflation, pay claims are going to go in that are not, you know, that are going to cause, you know, a certain amount of industrial um, strife across all uh, sectors, so we're not going to be immune from that, so 
Um, I think it is watch this space, but it is a risk. Um, and again, across the whole, you know, the bus network as well. You know, the similar pressures coming through all, all sectors. Um, that we have got a significant recruitment drive for the MCA at the moment, and have boosted the capacity in the HR department to cope with that, to help alleviate some of these risks that are coming through. I think I think it's it's a bit depending which t which sector you're trying to recruit into. I think you know there have been some challenges. Um, oh, sorry, Dave wants to come in, but I think there have been some challenges, and we address those you know as as they arise. Um, you know, demand across a number of our areas is you know high, and we're competing with in the same market as other people in, in the public sector, particularly. Yeah. Yes, Fred, do you want to come in there? Yeah, if, if I might, I didn't hear all of Reese's question, but but to the point about the resourcing in the organisation, uh, Steve's covered it, uh, covered most of the actions. The, the only one that um, he didn't reference is that is because we're trying to manage this in difficult circumstances. Um, the uh, we're now having weekly uh, reports to the management board from. The head of HR on the recruitment drive, the issues that are arising as a consequence of that, which, as Steve has said, is differential. It's more challenging in some areas than others, uh, and it gives us the opportunity to continue to look at uh, the tactics that we're deploying to attract the right candidates uh, to the roles. All critical roles are being filled uh, a, uh, in an in on an interim basis where where it's going to take longer to fill on a long term basis so we're not leaving critical roles um empty as a consequence of the of the process the inevitable time it takes to recruit to permanent uh, positions so we're, we're taking mitigating actions and we're monitoring it corporately as a as a board thanks Dave. If, I, if i could just finish up on this point it some of the pressures that, that the RE faces aren't necessarily due to vacancies internally, but vacancies in our delivery partners as well. So right across our activity, whether it be in the construction sector, whether it be in the suppliers we're engaging to deliver our ad adult education budget activity, whether it be with our internal audit colleagues who are struggling to recruit and retain staff and so on, the pressures elsewhere eventually become a pressure on, on our activity. It's just a clarification, Chair. Liz, you asked, you, you said at one point in your talk, you'd specifically like feedback from the committee on, and then I missed that bit, so what was it? Was it the presentation? Yes, it was, Councillor. Um, Reese has spoken previously and asked for more dashboard information, yeah. so I was hoping this might met that need. Oh, it's comprehensive. Yes, I completely agree. Um, if it was in itself a solution to the to the risk we're encountering, <laughs> they'd all be solved. Thank you, Chair. Very good. Yeah, unfortunately, risks aren't always solved that easily, are they? <laughs> okay, is there any further feedback on that? Comments or questions? Yes, Angela? Um, I, th I thought it was a, a very good report, Liz, and as um, uh, joined with Rhys, so you did to be congratulated for it. The question I wanted to ask is who, who will be picking this up um, when Liz goes? Because there's still quite a lot of development work to be done on the risk management system. So I think we need to bring Angela back in on your annual report, Angela. 
I don't really need to say any more on what's in the report, really. That, that covers um, uh, what the panel uh, did during the year um, and what it found and uh, any recommendations it had for going forward. Um, so if, if anybody has any questions or comments on it, that would be very helpful. Any feedback, comments, questions? I, I, I can only comment that, that Angie's report is a very full report of what happened in the year. I mean, it, it was disappointing in terms of attendance, and, um, and she flagged that up. Yeah. And then, then, then the point is where you take that panel forward if you want to take it forward. And it was suggested that we have a debate on that at, at the next meeting if we can fit it into the agenda. Some of the other issues have already been covered and will be covered in other forums. Um, if, if so, if there's no further comment on that, thank you very much, Angela. And we'll move on to the oh yes, um, item 12, which is draft accounts. Yes, Chair, I'll pick that up okay. if you don't mind. Um, so, really. This is only intended to be a very brief um, item it's for information. It's just to keep the committee up to date on where we are with the um, production and the publication of the draft statutory accounts for the financial year ended 2021 straight 22. So um, currently the position is that the, the uh, accounts are well underway in the process of final review and moderation. Um, for instance, Gareth and I will be um, undertaking our final reviews next week. Um, for the PTE accounts, I'm due to meet with Angela the week after that, and she'll cast her eye over it and no doubt give me lots of challenge. And then our target for publication is the 30th of June, which is one calendar month ahead of the statutory deadline of the 31st of July. There are some moving parts, Chair, in terms of the timetable, which I've set out indicatively within the report. And this is hot off the press. Um, so to update you on behalf of Hassan from EY, who's not here today, I spoke to him yesterday morning to find out where he was up to in terms of um, the recruitment point that Gareth touched on earlier. So the good news is that he has now found a replacement for Rayner, who was our audit manager, or EY's audit manager previously. It's a lady called Sue Gill, who by all accounts has plenty of local government audit experience. So that's good news. Um, the slight challenge is getting that confirmed internally within EY. Uh, she has been earmarked for it. We can maintain continuity in terms of the in charge who will be working on the job, who's worked on, on our audits in previous years. The final bit of the negotiation chair is in terms of agreeing the dates for the actual audit. EY's proposal doesn't quite fit with what they um, had originally informed me they were planning to do. Um, it does fit in terms of the production of the draft accounts in terms of they, they want to undertake planning next month. Um, the slight issue that I do need to iron out with them is how close they're proposing to do the audit compared to the statutory deadline for um, you as a committee to review and scrutinise the final audited statements. So I'll be going back to Hassan to um, argue for a date that is more in advance of what he's originally proposed. So subject to getting that all dealt with, I'm, I'm confident that we will hit our statutory deadlines. Um, and also one point which is slightly um, off topic of this item, Chair, but I just thought I should mention it because um, I missed it from the action log, so apologies for that, was um, training. So the committee has previously expressed an interest in training, um, not just for the accounts, but also for treasury management, um, because it is quite a highly technical and complex area. and. Um, I do know that committee members have previously expressed an interest in this. So we have lined up um, Link Asset Management Services, who are our Treasury advisors, and they were prepared to come and do some training um, earlier this month. However, because of the change in the committee membership, we felt it was appropriate to wait till that was fully confirmed and then to agree the dates um, with yourselves and with Link. So we will, um, now that we've got confirmation of who the members are, we will come back to you with some proposed dates and we'll get that booked in for either later this month or earlier next month to suit your diaries. 
that's all from me, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, you just indicated a slight difficulty in EY confirming the uh, manager. Is that likely to be extended? Will it delay anything? The, the, the risk in the short term will be that if there's any delay in that being rubber stamped internally within EY, that it would push back the, the dates of the planning audit, which is currently scheduled for the week commencing the 4th of July. Um, however, Hassan reassures me that it should just be a, a matter of technicality. So I have asked um, for a meeting with the new manager at least one, if not two weeks before the start of the planning audit. So not only can we get through all the formal introductions, but they we make sure that they've set out for us um, what they refer to as the prepared by client, which is basically their, their wish list of things that they want us to prepare in advance of the visit, because that to me is critical if we're going to make best use of their time and ours. And if we get the planning audit done successfully, Chair, that should, in theory, minimise the amount of substantive testing that's required at the full, final stage and therefore speed up the process and make sure that we can get a set of audited statements to yourselves in good time before the statutory deadline of 30th of November. I was just sitting here thinking it's been quite tight. <laughs> Otherwise, even in better circumstances, but here we are. I, I don't know what more you, you, you can uh, really say while we're waiting the deadline. So I've, I've recognised um, the, the committee has, has um, expressed its um, frustration, would be a harsh word, um, with um, some of the some of the issues we've been experiencing in, in proceeding with the audit. Um, and obviously, um, we've tried to address this as diplomatically as possible as, as senior managers with, with the auditors. So for example, I did raise um, some previously expressed concerns with, with Hassan yesterday when I met with him. Um, I'm also conscious that the chair um, had expressed a desire for me to raise our concerns with the independent body, which is responsible for reviewing the quality. And I have contacted them to raise our concerns, so I'm, I'm asking for um, guidance from the PSAA on how we can tackle some of these quality issues. So, um, other than other than that, councillor, uh, was there anything else that um, you felt might be appropriate for us to pursue? There's, well, I guess there is a reporting chain that we can pursue internally until somebody takes notice, better notice. I don't know what sort of relationship we have with, with them. I, I think a complaint to the external body as a raising a concern um, might help concentrate minds. I think it's, it, I guess, it's just a, a complete guess, I imagine pursuing it formally is a bit more time doesn't really help move things forward it just helps with retribution if it's required but uh, I'm assuming we're doing everything we can I'm, I'm sitting there thinking we'll probably have to have a special meeting and uh, delegate signing it off and that sort of stuff which we, we have done for the last two, two years I don't really want to do that so I'm assuming you're going to, somebody's going to, Gareth, who's <laughs> yeah, going to make certain it doesn't happen. Ask God to come in on that. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's two parts to this. There are the bits that are in our direct control, and then there are the bits that we, we can influence. Um, so the bits that are in our direct control is making sure that we're ready and we're good to go and we're as prepared as possible, such that when the auditor comes in, we, that we make life as easy as possible so they can get over the line as quickly as possible. And Mike's team have, have done that. So we, we will be complete with, with a, a lot to spare. And we, we are doing our, our reviews next week so we have, a, we have a good run at making sure that we're ready to go. Our leaders around influencing EY to get on with this are largely through our, um, our relationship with, with the auditors themselves, so with, with Hassan and team but also with PSAA 
as as the the authorizing body and essentially the contract holder. So we are ahead of the curve in getting into into the ribs of PSAA now and saying this is or, already not looking good. It wasn't looking good months back when ordinarily we would have had a pre audit that would start in quarter four of the preceding financial year and we never had it. And now we've still not seen them and they will be coming in late. So our external auditors are pushing the timeline ever more. So we, we, we are following a, a trail of, of correspondence up with PSAA now saying it, it was bad, it's getting worse. Please make sure that it doesn't get any 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 worse. Um, and it's just it's worthy of remembering that we were one of the nine percent of local authority audits that were completed within the statutory deadline last year. So we have a pretty good track record of getting this done and getting it done with EY, um, and we just need to keep building on that. So, Chair, if you think it's helped, I'm quite happy to admit it that we're concerned. I mean, we, we sort of like said, you know, we said we're concerned, but I mean, like, you know, pressure, I, because, and forgive me on the acronym, but we're given, we're, we're given the auditors, aren't we? We don't, uh, we, we don't um, have too much influence over who we get. So, so we opt into the national yes, processes. The, which is what the, we did, yeah. The audits are essentially appointed yeah. by and, the national. And on the face of it, that was the right that seemed a very simple decision to make because it yeah. seemed the easiest way to get yeah. things d completed. The, the decision is still the right yeah. decision. It, there are just significant pressures within the external audit industry nationwide and we're, we're seeing symptoms of that at the local level. Sorry, to bring Reese, I have to ask, would it make a difference if we had an alternative uh, auditor? I suspect not. Um, whether this is good news or bad news for your councillor Loft, we um, we have a contract with EY as brokered through the PSAA procurement framework, which lasts through to the end of the audit of next year's stat accounts. That will be the fifth and final year. PSAA are, are in the process of undertaking the full re-procurement exercise, so we should know probably next year, About normally it's about a year in advance, I believe, Gareth, isn't it, who our new auditor will be. So the process is underway. We have, as this committee voted to, opt into the re-procurement exercise, which is what the vast majority of local uh, government bodies do indeed do. Um, so all I can say for now is that that process is underway, council offs, and we should be advised next year who the new auditor will be. I, I wasn't suggesting that we change, uh, change horses midstream. Uh, I was just trying to determine whether there is a qualitative difference between uh, auditors or are they all bound by the same restrictions? Um, it, it depends what sorts of restrictions you, you mean, Chair. I think the, 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 there's, as Gareth's touched on, there is, a, there is a fundamental issue with resourcing in the audit sector, which is why, as Gareth said before, 91% of audits weren't completed on time. And I think one of the reasons why EY is struggling themselves to resource our 21-22 audit is we were their only clients from their northwest office who got over the line by the 30th of November. They are still mopping up the backlog of 2021 audits. And because they are under very tight statutory time pressure to do NHS audits immediately after the financial year end, then local government audits for 21-22 go to the very back of the queue, which is why everything's been shunted towards the end of this calendar year. So I, I, I've heard this um, anecdotally, Chair, from my counterparts and other um, combined authorities where it doesn't matter what badge the auditor is, it could be Mazars, it could be Deloitte's, very similar stories being told. And I know it's not helpful to this committee, but that's one of the restrictions that the sector is facing. They're the kind of restrictions on them. Thank you. Yeah. Well, that, that brings me on to the one point that hasn't been mentioned, of course, and it, it's also impacted by um, resource, I guess, and that is of that our delay has always been on the last yard stop, the valuation of the pension fund, which is another set of auditors. And I'm afraid they're still in this loop. So 
who knows where we're going to be with them. I um, I knew you would ask this question, Reese, which is when I met with um, Hassan yesterday, I asked him exactly the same question and to remind him that um, I would appreciate an urgent update on his conversations with the partner at Deloitte to give this uh, committee assurance that they will be able to fulfil their um, additional assurance requirements that they've, they've been asking for for the last two or three years. Um, I'm waiting for Hassan to give me confirmation that he has had that conversation. So perhaps as an action for me to take away is um, with Cou Councillor Loftus's uh, blessing is to maybe arrange an offline conversation between himself, my, myself and Hassan to discuss the committee's position on this. I think that, that would strengthen and add to uh, Councillor Orkham's um, recommendation that we meet our concerns. Yes. It's just one final point on the, the pension funds. One of the things that often impacts the pension fund valuations are significant items in Q4 um, that mean that they have to revalue. So pension fund normally values its, its portfolio around January. Those are the numbers that we get and then they retest later in the year around March to see if there's any material difference between what they thought was going to be the position in January and what they thought about what actually happened in March. We had the EU's exit from the European Union a few years back in March. We had the 2020 lockdown in March and then 2021 we went into further restrictions again in Q4. These all impacted on the, the need for the pension fund to um, to revalue its its assets again, hopefully this year. I can't think of any big movements. It's minor minor matter of a war in the Ukraine, unfortunately. <laughs> Apart from yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> wipe that from my memory. Yeah. <laughs> Remind you to turn your mics on and off as you're speaking. Apparently, other people can't hear. Thanks. So the chair. <laughs> I, I think our discussion here, chair, is just a reflection on the general state of affairs, much bigger than our remit round the table. Where are we now? Um, So are we all content with that report? Yeah. Questions, comments, no, no. Thank you very much for that report. Uh, internal audit reports. Who is uh, Hi, Chair. It'll be, my, it'll be myself talking through right. those. Um, can you Peter? Um, so, yeah, I'll start with the, the progress report, which is on page 47 of your pack. Um, just a very brief update on this one. Um, the report provides an update on progress against the 21-22 internal audit plan. There's one draft report that has been issued there um, since the last Audit Standards and Risk Committee meeting. That's the risk management one. The assurance rating for that one is sitting at significant assurance with, with some improvement required. Uh, and it's also just worth noting for this one as well, there is field work underway for for the governance review. Um, I'll just leave it there. I think I can take the report as read. It's, it's a very brief report. Happy to take any comments on that one. Thank you. Um, any comments, questions, reflections? All in favour? Thank you very much. Thank you for your report. Well, please, right. <laughs> well done. Thank you, thank you, Chair. It was yes. Yeah. So I'll move on to the next one, which is the recommendation tracker, um, which is page fifty-five of the packet papers of one hundred and twenty-eight, uh, and this one just provides again a status of the internal audit recommendations. So during the period, we have been reporting against twenty-eight live actions. Um, of those twenty-eight, fourteen have been implemented. Nine are not yet due. There are five overdue there. And it's worth pointing out that of those five that are overdue, none of those are uh, high ratings. So there's two medium ratings 
and the three are low ratings. Update of those two medium ratings is included in, in the annex there, in the appendix there. And it is also worth saying we are following up again um, on these before we finalise the Head of Internal Audit Opinion, which is the, the next report, which I'll, I'll speak to shortly. Um, and we are continuing to receive information through in regards to these open recommendations. So it's likely that there will be further updates um, on these by the, by the end of June. Happy to open up again for comments on that one. The, um, I think the, the ability to close out the recommendations is a question that often comes up at, at this committee. Um, a year or so ago, we were very slow in closing out recommendations, and we're seeing an improvement now. I think 89% is the figure that, that, that's being thrown at us. The question I have, though, with, with a degree of cynicism, which I often have, is how much of that is down to rescheduling? Because if you reschedule you, before you get late and then move it out and then reschedule again, you could appear as though you are closing things out on time. So are we seeing an increase in the number of the, in the amount that's being rescheduled or are we actually closing out quicker? Happy to respond to that one. Yes, yeah, so we are seeing an actual response um, in terms of actual closing out and um, uh, perhaps one of the, the areas which um, you'll notice if you look at the annex there is that we don't necessarily always have rescheduled dates. It's an area that we're working on, in fact, on improving um, going forward. So in actual fact, some of these don't even have uh, rescheduled, uh, rescheduled dates in place. So yes, there's a bit of a combination there, but the majority of them are actual closeouts. I can give some comfort on that. Um, actually, I was going to ask you that question, but I think you've, you've probably already answered what is the deadline on, on implementing yeah. these now, or these two? We are following that up to try and get some updated uh, deadlines for those. I know the process for following up recommendations internally is changing, um, and so we were hoping to get those revised dates. Um, I don't know, Mike, if you're wanting to, to come in on that. Uh, we, we can provide an update on that. So there, there, there's some nuance in, um, in all this. So if I just take the asset management activity and so the action um, came out of the um, the the audit report was to that we needed to embed um, life cycle maintenance costs and capital renewals planning into our, our budget um, and business planning activity so the, the due date was was probably a bit wrong in the way that we described this um, in hindsight but we have done as much as we basically can do so the team have been busy over the last few months um, doing um, um, equipment and maintenance reviews, um, capital renewal planning. Um, so we now have full life cycle planning for all um, fabric um, of our buildings, of, of all our um, heavy equipment and light equipment, um, and right down to when we need to do a, a paint job on individual buildings. So we've, we've essentially done the bulk of the activity the reason that this is still open is that the activity the, the, the recommendation was then to align that into our budget and financial planning activity and that's the business planning process that will be underway in the the next few months so we've broken the back of the task we now just need to embed it into into our planning so i can't say that the the action is is, is complete in that sense but we we're well on track Sorry. Uh, yes, please, Chair. So in response to the outstanding uh, meeting risk recommendation around fraud, um, a quick update is that um, back in Q4, um, I met with, with Gareth and agreed my approach with him, which was to undertake a slightly more comprehensive approach to this than what's been set out there. So um, what will be happening is for every single management area, uh, which we... Um, covered as part of last year's business planning process. So there are roughly 25 management areas across the business, it's like a, few, a few more than that recently created. And for every single one of those uh, management areas chair, I will be undertaking a risk assessment for fraud specifically. And that will complement the work that Liz has diligently been doing through, um, through her review of all, all risks in a particular area. So I've already undertaken initial conversations with Liz on Tuesday, I think it was, Liz, wasn't it? Uh, well, we focused on a couple of um, our favourite areas of uh, skills and finance in particular. 
what we will be doing is finalising that piece of work. I was going to say Thursday, but I think we need to bring it forward to Tuesday. Um, so we will finalise that piece of work, Chair. And all being well, without too many bits of rectification, we should have that done by the end of this quarter, 30th of June. Just so we're up to the task of continuing the edge of work. I'm pretty sure we are. Uh, and next report, please. Draft annual report. Thank you, Chair. Yes, so this one starts on page 63 um, of your pack, and it's worth um, pointing out a few things before I, I get into the detail of this one. So first is that it is a draft uh, opinion, um, absolutely, just while we're finishing off and finalising the, the final couple of reviews there. And secondly, we are in the process of preparing two um, for the two statutory bodies. So we've got one for the Mayor Combined Authority and one for the, the Passenger Transport Executive, um, just to align with the financial and annual governance statement reporting. Um, but that being said, the messages and the assurances that are in this paper here will not change. It will be effectively the same as what you're seeing um, in this paper here. Um, we're expecting to issue the final Head of Internal Audit Opinion by the end of this month, by the end of June. Um, and so this report, the Head of Internal Audit Opinion, provides a summary of the work undertaken during the year. It, it does provide the opinion based upon obviously those key areas of risk management, internal controls and governance as well as how that implementation of your actions has, has gone during the year. And there's a summary there on, on page five or on page 67 of the pack, depending which one you're, you're looking at, of the work carried out. And I would just highlight um, to committee's attention that sufficient work has indeed been provided for and undertaken to our opinion to be given. And crucially, there's been no no assurance reports issued during the year. Um, in terms of recommendations, there's been 34 raised during the year. All of these were accepted by management. None of those were high rated recommendations. Uh, and the summary table on page nine or on page 71 of your pack, depending how you're following through again, provides an overview of the reviews, the ratings and the number of recommendations made against those reviews. Um, as I say, the, high, the, the opinion is, is in draft, um, but the interim opinion uh, for 21-22 is significant assurance um, with improvement required. Um, I guess I don't need to turn through the rest of the pages. I can take the rest of the pack as read and happy again to open up for any questions or comments. Questions or comments, please. Angela. Um, on the, the governance review that you're still completing, um, is uh, depending on what opinion comes in for that, um, will that affect the overall opinion? Or will is it likely, even if it does come in with partial assurance that they still will still have a, a significant assurance overall opinion yes happy to provide some comfort on that one so the theoretical answer is yes it could um change things especially if it came back as a as a no assurance report or some such but the work that's already been undertaken has given us comfort to be able to provide the opinion in this draft stage and we're comfortable to see can't say with certainty. We have to, as internal auditors, leave a bit of a caveat there just in case a bit of wriggle room. But we're comfortable enough to say at this point that it's extremely unlikely that that would that, that would the, the outcomes from that would change the opinion in any way, shape, or form. Anything further from everyone? No. All comfortable with that. Thank you. Thank you very much for your report. the annual governance review, Claire James. Thank you, Chair. Um, so this paper reports on the findings of the uh, annual governance review and presents the annual draft annual governance statement <coughs> for 2021-22. And <laughs> um, so really this is just seeking any um, amendments or additions that the, the committee feels need to be made before it's presented to the combined authority in July. And obviously there is an opportunity to bring it back to the committee at the next meeting in July. So the paper outlines the process that was undertaken for the AGR, which was reported to the committee since the beginning of the year and the progress of that um, and the conclusion of that review. And the draft statements included at Appendix A, um, 
the statement also includes a government's improvement plan for 22-23 and that's on page 96 of the pack. We're currently working through with officers how we measure and monitor and report on those actions as part of that government improvement plan. So just really see if there's any feedback today on anything that members feel needs to be added to the statement um, and obviously it also includes the draft um, internal audit opinion as Peter's just mentioned. Thank you. Feedback? Questions? Comments? All satisfied? Wonderful. Thank you very much for that. And moving on, you're up next. Draft Chair's annual report. Thank you. This is item 58, page 99 in the pack. So it um, presents a draft annual report um, and again just seeking some feedback um, from, the, from the committee on any additions or amendments that might need to be made. One thing I have just noticed as I was flipping through the pack is it looks like there's been an error in the upload of the document to the system. So there is an appendices with some tables on there, but it looks like it's been omitted. I think it might be the system that's done that because it was in a different format. So apologies for that. Um, the summary of that information is in the report, but I will circulate those those slides afterwards. It's just three slides with some data in there just to support some of the information. So apologies for that. Um, so yeah, just seeking some feedback on the content of the report before it goes to the NCA. Thank you. Are you content with that? Does anybody want to make a comment, ask a question? Thank you, Asa. Um, it says that in terms of membership, I mean, I, I wasn't aware that the committee, this, uh, the current, the old structure of the committee also had reserves. Because it surprises me if that was the case that we had so many meetings that weren't quorum, um, and so now that the committee is reduced, I think one of the benefits was that it would also there would also be reserves. So I, I'm wondering what sort of confidence we've got that even with a smaller committee, we'll meet any quorum and requirements. Because um, if the reserve policy didn't work before, why would it work now? I would imagine that's precisely why we're trialling the, the, the smaller committee, but Steve, you want to? I think also we're going to, tr just to answer that question, partly, is we're going to try and be much more proactive in, in the planning of the meetings and then through the Democratic Services team, contacting members, in fact, they may have noticed this time or contact to check whether you're attending, and if not, can you reserve attend? Um, so there's an intention, I say, within the Democratic Services team to be much more proactive. So hoping to have a smaller team of, of members who are, are more available and, and also, I say, proactively manage that attendance. So we've got 12-month trial agreed by the MCA of this, of this size committee. So we'll hopefully see um, whether it works or not. And if not, we'll make another proposal to the MCA next June. I think from my point of view, uh, the, as, as as an elected member, there's always been an inherent difficulty in the um, substitute situation because if, for instance, I'm at the meeting which I can't miss, so is my substitute. So <laughs> there have always been difficulties with that. Um, and we hope that the greater commitment from lesser people, from not lesser people, lesser numbers of people, <laughs> Uh, we'll, we'll solve that um, and of course along with the uh, inc increased liaison, improved liaison with democratic services in each of the local authorities it's something we've just got to try to get right yes please Bef before we move to that number we, we did some benchmarking with other combined authorities because all combined authorities are having the same trouble with audit and overview committees um, and, and the model we've sort of followed now is the Manchester model, where they only have four members of their authority. They seem to have less porous issues than other authorities. So I say we benchmarked where other authorities were um, to come up with that. I think all we can do is try it in over the next 12 months and hope. It's right. I, I think the, the, the core of members that we have now is more committed and. Um, 
no, 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 more focused, perhaps. Um, and I think we'll be better going forward. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. Have, have we got the dates of all the meetings penciled in for the current municipal year? Because one thing I could do is just check with my substitute that is actually likely to be likely to be available if I know that there's a class coming up. I don't know. We are meant to realise we can't attend the meeting and tell our sub our substitute to be on standby. That's sometimes the point at which you realise they've got a clash exactly as uh, Philip's uh, substitute Scott uh, might very well have that same that same clash. Um, but uh, I'm sitting there thinking that is one useful thing I could, if we've got the dates, um, which might have been somewhere else and I've not noticed them, you know, but us, we've generally been here, so it's not been an issue, but uh, there might be a clash. And I'll try and think on to say, you know, are you generally available? Cause, because there might be a permanent fixture of a meeting and we might have to try and get another, another person on standby my, my, my point really was yeah. that if there's a, a budget cabinet, uh, sorry, a, a budget council, yeah. you can't really get out of it, can you? <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. it's difficult. Yeah. Uh, but I'm sure Claire will get over all these difficulties. Yeah. <laughs> and come through. I don't, I don't even know what we're doing in Sheffield with this new it's system. <laughs> you know, oh, that will work. The dates are, are already in place and yeah. they've been uh, communicated with Democratic Services and we do look at all the full council and cabinet meetings as part of the planning. Um, but I'm sure Christine's difficult, you know, checking and double checking and, and working with officers to, to make sure that. So for, for us, we've got to be aware of when the committee, whenever the, each of the program committees mm -hmm. meet a guest, because mm -hmm. there, there could be a clash. Perhaps the transport committee, I'm on that. I don't think there is going to be a clash, but yeah. if you tell us the dates, then Christine yeah. just told me the dates from Democratic Services. All right. You tell I'm, sure, I'm sure it's in train, yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll make sure I that's in the diary. Make certain yeah. that, that I know. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, it, just, yeah. it just tends to appear in the diary, doesn't it? Yes. Oh, gosh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you very much for your good work on that, yeah. and uh, best of luck going forward. Just one question before we, before we do that. I turned it off, sorry. I, I noticed we're one, one short today, and I think um, there are two reserves that could have come in according to this list. I don't know whether that's still the reserve list that we're running for. Oh, okay. In which case, I'm surprised if you were sort of progressing reserves that that you weren't able to uh, to fill that chair today. Or as you say, it might be that everyone's at the same meeting. I, I, all I can say from this situation, uh, from, from my situation now is uh, please bear with us uh, because this is the first meeting and hopefully it will be better. But we are in the hands of individuals to some extent. Yeah, and just, just to say that the, um, the list in the paper is retrospective, it's of the last year. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there was just, uh, just one comment on the effectiveness improvement plan, uh, the possible options and action. Uh, I think it would be clearer if you put on there, undertake an open recruitment exercise to replace and grow the independent membership. Content. Thank you very much. Thank you, Claire. Well done. <coughs> uh, health and safety update, Lee Sutton. Thank you, Chair. Um, we've all received the report highlighting the incidents and accidents from the period 1st of January to 31st of March. We're just here to answer any questions or concerns that anybody may have. Any concerns? Chris, have you got any more detail on the uh, near misses? Um, 
there seem to be quite a few, and I just I just wonder whether they were going to lead to something if they're not being tackled. So, is there anything on the near misses that we should be thinking about? The near misses within our own organisation, or the near misses in relation to the tron. Either, if they both end up being something we don't want. Um, the near misses. There's no there's no correlation in any of those within our own organisation. Obviously, they're thoroughly investigated. Um, there have been some changes in the past where we've made in relation to signage to stop people going on the runways, but there's no, there's nothing in relation to the ones at our own interchanges. In relation to the ones on the tram um, and the bus operators, it's very difficult to get information from them. Um, I've been back to the bus operators and they're a bit reluctant to give us more information than they currently do. Apparently they're under no obligation to give us that information anyway. Um, we have just had a health safety light rail officer appointed within the tram team. He's my in into the sizal now um, and he's hopefully going to get more information in relation to everything in relation to the tram riddles, near misses and accidents. So moving forward might have more information on that um, but there's nothing from my point of view there's nothing in relation to the near misses that we're aware of um, that we need to worry about okay because I, I, I was going to bring up i think the need to get that information from um our partners and the word is partners you know we're, we're operating with buses in a partnership arrangement if they're not prepared to share information with us that doesn't give me the impression that we're working in partnership um, and I think it's important they do share it because, you know, both both sides have got uh, have got a need here to make sure that we, we have a strong health and safety remit and accidents don't occur. So I would hope that we can find some way of pressurising our partnering organisations to provide us with that information and not just lean back and accept the fact that they say they don't have to provide it with us. I don't think that's a good enough answer, quite frankly. Yeah, I'll, <clears throat> I'll speak to Tim Taylor and see if he can put some pressure on them. I mean, I do, it is the actual, you know, the head of operations that I go to and they're saying that they, they're not under any obligation to give us that information. I don't know whether that's right or not, so I will take that up with Tim. Well, as I say, we shouldn't accept it, I don't think. They may well say it to us, but we shouldn't accept it. And believe you and me, I've been back to them loads of time trying to put my own pressure on them. <laughs> so take, take a bigger, bigger hammer. <laughs> industry we may struggle to get that data but we'll, we'll keep pressing for it. Who has the ultimate legal responsibility then if there's an accident? Is it the operator or is it us? Uh, on, on the bus it, it rests with the individual operators unless it's potentially on our bus station site and it's our our negligence or our fault. Um, on the tram again liability rests with the operator uh, under the um, safety management system but we do have obligations our own safety management system for the tram and Ms Lynn says we've appointed a safety officer within the um, PTE combined authority to undertake some of that role but but in terms of you know operational accidents if you like most of that risk or all that risk will lie with those operators There are some things that, that whilst you're talking about the, the tram, Steve, there are some things that came out of the uh, report from the accident down in Croydon, which are on our plate because we own the infrastructure. Um, and those we certainly do have, we do have to pick up and make, make sure we've dealt with. 
uh, and we and for sure we are we we have a safety management system for in in respect of our obligation of tram you're right we do own most of the infrastructure um and then the contracts are arranged for stagecoach to pass most responsibility on but we do have like i say an owning asset responsibility um you know, hence things like re-railing and all, all the work we do on the system I mean, en enhanced partnership provides for more data sharing. I think things that we normally uh, that we'd say, well, that's commercially confidential. I think so. Whether it would extend to this, but I do agree with comments about uh, the spirit of partnership. I just wonder if we if we could ask. Oh, never mind them saying, well, they're under no obligation to provide it. Perhaps. Have they given an explanation which just says, "Well, why aren't they providing it? You know, why? Why? What? What is the reason?" And ask them to tell us. Tell us directly. I have been back to them and said, "You know, I get I get information from Stagecoach Supertram. Yeah. You know, I'm trying to look at the whole operations, the whole of the transport network." And for the reasons that I bring it here, but they just, I'm yeah, just getting nowhere. Have they actually said, what? they're under no obligation to do it? Why? Have they not? Well, really, what reason? Why, why is that the reason we can't share it? Because we've got more than enough to do, don't we? Don't we? Sorry, Chair. Yeah, and we, we seem to, yeah. I seem to have lost their habits. Pressing the button, yes, indeed. It, yeah, so asking them why they don't feel, I mean, and asking them to say we'd be interested, the committee would be interested in knowing well, what, what the issue is. It, it might be we don't want any more work to do, you know, things like that, but. I think for said council, we'll, we'll redouble our efforts to ask them and, and limb through, through Tim Taylor's team. Can, you know, then we can see what pressure, what response we get, and then further what further pressure we can put on. Yeah. So I don't know if Tim's asked them, the office either, exactly. Well, why? We'll take that forward. I'm not going to mind them on. <laughs> Thank you very much for that report, Lynn, and uh, best of luck with all your efforts. And the next is uh, Gareth with Bridge of Control Supports. Uh, nothing to report. Um, so, yeah. Good. That's the kind of report we all like. Thank you. Um, and uh, I mean, no questions to Gareth on that one, I assume. <coughs> okay. Uh, work plan, Claire. Yes, this is just a regular item on the, the work plan. Um, that we will next time bring back you know that we'll cover the next 12 months so if anyone has any input or and anything they want to see on that work plan including training opportunities um, then please let me know there's a climate change risk paper being moved back to july so i noticed it was i didn't notice in the pack we had it um, I'll look into why that's not being included in this agenda. I'm not aware myself, but um, it may be that it's moved forward onto the next meeting, but I'll check that and come back to you. Yeah, I, I'm on that same point. I've asked a couple of times um, and been assured that it will come forward, and it hasn't. So could you redouble on that one? Thank you very much. Uh, and on, on training, we will be updated on opportunities. Thank you. Anything further? No. Nope. Well, that brings me to the end of my agenda. Until the next meeting is there. Thank you very much for your attendance and your involvement.